On this episode, we talk to a refugee activist about Thailand's complicated and sometimes dark relationship with people fleeing Burma. So, if you want to learn more about the nuance of Thai identity as it applies to refugees, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadee crap and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 to find myself, and when I did, I exchanged myself for a new guy. Ah, and I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 17 years ago, fell in love with new mega malls opening every year, and never left. <laughs> nice, yeah. You're going to be here for a while, I guess, and never get bored. No doubt. They're still, op- they're still opening. <laughs> yeah, they sure are. Right off the bat, we want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, good friend of mine by the name of Scott Coates, who supports us at the show shout-out level. Now stick around after we're done talking about Burmese refugees in Thailand to hear why, despite being a good friend of mine, I think Scott may actually secretly want to kill me. Whoa, so good. he's a dangerous yeah. man. He's a dangerous man, that's Scott Coates. <laughs> he sure is. Uh, of course, one of the cool things that patrons like Scott get is an unscripted uncensored bonus episode every week where we talk about all kinds of stuff Uh, we just finished recording this week's bonus show and we chatted about why a shopping mall is bangkok's biggest opening of the year and if that's completely lame or actually a little bit cool and don't forget our meetup is this friday the 16th of november you might recall that on last week's show we accidentally mistakenly said the 10th but the real date is the 16th which is three days away from when this episode drops so more details are on our facebook page and uh, we hope to see you there we guarantee literally guarantee a good time <laughs> nice. on this show i interview ploy wen sing tai neo an expert on refugees in Thailand, particularly refugees from the Karen minority in Burma, many of whom, uh, in order to escape uh, persecution and conflict in their home country, have crossed into Thailand and live in camps along the border. Although the Karen make up about 7% of Burma's population, they have a troubled relationship with the Burmese government, to say the least, uh, and this has led to social and political problems for neighboring Thailand. And since that's about all Greg and I know about it, uh, let's get into our interview with Ploy Wen Sing Tanio. Okay, listeners, I'm here with another one of my former students who moved on from my university to a very interesting career. Uh, her name is Ploy Sing Tanio. And uh, after graduating from my program, she went on to work for a United States government program that specializes in the resettlement of refugees. Uh, And I'm going to let her uh, tell you more about it. So, uh, Ploy, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Um, So, my name is Ploy. I had experience working for the U.S. resettlement program for six years now. I started my first job um, in Bangkok, and then I moved to the refugee camp in Mesot, Thug, um, in the northern part of Thailand, and continued my career in the United States for another four years. So um, it has been um, a, lo- a while, but it's a really rewarding experience. Um, so right after I graduated from BS, um, Thammasat University, I started my first job at the International Rescue Committee in Bangkok. Um, basically, I just do the fact check of the refugee background um, before the Homeland Security come in and then have the refugee um, have the interval to the refugees. And then when I work at the refugee camps, I just make sure that um, their resettlement preparation are in place and that they are ready to travel to the United States. So let me just be clear on this part that um, we actually do not only send the refugees to the United States, but we actually have other 13 countries that they can choose to resettle. But I just happen to work for the U.S. resettlement program. So my best knowledge of the program will be um, focusing on the United States and not other countries. And um, after that, I um, 
I moved to the U.S. and while I was there, I did some internship and some jobs. But my most of my work still focus on the U.S. resettlement program. I um, interned with the Church World Service, um, which is uh, one of the nine resettlement agency in the United States. And what we do is we help. Um, refugees to assimilate into their new society, into their new home. We help them find jobs. We make sure that they understand the basic culture. We provide them the um, the cultural orientation. Um, as for my job, I make sure that refugees have a job and that they become self-sufficiency within 180 days. And all of this is um, we do it according to the cooperative agreement between our um, agency and the U.S. government. And then later I move on to work at the national um, headquarter. I did on-site and desktop monitoring um, for the federally program as well. And we just did monitoring across the United States and to make sure that our affiliates provide the basic needs that um, the refugees supposed to receive and the program that they're supposed to attend. And this program is funded by the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. I am currently now working on a USAID project with Education Development Center and um, we focusing on the training for the instructors in university levels and hoping that we can bridge the gap between the universities and the local businesses just to make sure that the student will have the job and that that skill will meet the local businesses demanding. And in the future, I hope that to go back to work in the refugee field because um, my passion is on this career field. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, some of our listeners might not know, and even I don't know that much about refugees in Thailand. So, so first, I just want to ask some basic questions about how it works. So first off, who, who exactly are the people that you're trying to help in Thailand? Like, are they, so these are people who are not Thai citizens, or where do they come from? Mm -hmm. Who are they? Okay, so um, so I most workly with, um, with the current refugees. I know that a lot of people have heard about the Rohingya refugees, but unfortunately, that is a different part of the Thailand that I work with and a different program. So just want to be clear that I will um, only mention about the current refugee group. So they, um, so yes, they're not a Thai citizen and they come from Myanmar. They first arrived, I believe, in early 1980s. Um, mostly they're from um, the Kalin and, and Karini ethnic cities. Um, they're fleeing from the country because of there was a prosecution um, by the Burmese government. And you know that like their villages, their houses, their um, school, religious building were burned to the ground. And they, so they fled to our country and they have been residing in Ref nine refugee camps along the Thai border for nearly 30 years now. Um, as of now, I know that there are about 100,000 of them residing in the camps at the moment. Okay, so these camps are set up by the Thai government. So that means the, the, refu the, the, the refugees, they are, they're, are they considered legally in thailand but they have some kind of special status because obviously they're not a normal immigrant like you said they're they're running away mm -hmm. from a horrible situation mm -hmm. so the thai government uh the thai government built camps for them to live in is that is that how it works okay so, um so at first when they flee to our country they don't have they really don't have like a camp setting yet and Thailand, you know, like they do not want to recognize these people as the refugees. So I just want to be clear on this part is that um, Thailand did not sign the 1951 Refugee Convention. And that gives them a way to just get away with all these refugee things. So that means they don't recognize refugee as a refugees. They, call, they rather call them as um displaced person fleeing from fighting. They do not even recognize um, refugee camp as a refugee camp, but rather the temporary shelter. 
So there was going on this conflict at first because you know how they want to maintain the relationship with Myanmar, and so they don't want to protect these people, right? But later, um, the, later the situation got escalated. Um, there was an ongoing fight inside the country, and it's not until um, early 2000 when they finally. Um, allow the UNSCR, which is the UN Refugee Agency, to register this refugee as a refugee. So I would just call them refugee, but I mean, in legally Thai document, they're not refugee. But um, they allow the UNSCR to register these people as a refugee and to receive the basic needs that the UNSCR and other international organization humanitarian that provide to these people. But the problem is they have these um, little rules that um, if you come before 2005, you are qualified to register as a refugee. If you come after November 2005, they do not allow you to register as a refugee. And so that is okay, when let me, it all okay, begins. Let me, mm-hmm. Okay, I just want, I just want to clarify something. So, what? So the Thai government does not want to recognize them as official refugees, and mm-hmm. the reason they the reason they the reason they don't want to do that is to maintain a better relationship with Myanmar. Is, is that correct? I think part of that too, and I I personally think that is also because. They want to avoid the responsibilities and the burden that come with the refugee terms. Like when you become the host country that you hold for the asylum seekers in terms of international level law, you have all these procedures that you have to follow. And because, you know, Thailand is not rectifying on the 1951 refugee um, convention, so they can like get away with it. They don't need to follow the international rule. They can dictate their own rules. They can dictate their own procedure. And, you know, just to trying to avoid these terms, because, I mean, usually no one wants to be the host country. It's, um, it's come a lot of cost than the benefit. So the Thai government uh, calls them displaced persons. They, they don't have uh, all the responsibilities that they would have if they were official refugees, but at the same time, the Thai government does mm-hmm. not uh, uh, the Thai government does not arrest them. The Thai government does not deport them. The Thai government does not just kick them out. So the Thai government is is allowing them to live in Thailand. That that's correct. It's basically like they kind of turn their blind eyes on that part because, as you know, Burmese um, migrant. We have those Burmese migrant who benefit to the country revenue by, you know, providing the cheap labor, right? So they kind of like turn blind eye on that part. And another part is that, you know, like that policy is kind of, um, that policy toward the Burmese refugees in Thailand is kind of changing. Um, it depends on economic issues and the relationship between the two countries. Like they would be more consider. So, like at the certain period of time, they're more considered about the economic matters over, you know, the natural resources, tourism, and the integration of the long neck women whose camp has been um, self sufficient due to the tourist revenue. So, you know, like they don't want to recognize them, but because they provide such a revenue to the area, the country, especially the Massot area, is a very booming economy. and. It just it's just hard to deny that, you know, the revenue in that area doesn't come from the Burmese people, the Burmese business. So in if you ever visit that area, I'm sure many experts um, have visited that area. You will see that a lot of Burmese, um, a lot of Burmese business person and Thai people even benefit from that part, too. So they kind of turn blind eye on this part. But when it comes to um there was a growing problem, you know, that <clears throat> concern about the national security part. So it becomes to the point that they worry about um, the security, the security issue as much as the economic issue, like interstate conflict that, that caused by the refugees and economic interests have affected Thai policy toward the Burmese refugees. 
So I think it kind of depends on what situation going on at each period of time. Okay, um, I just to help me understand this. So what I'm trying to figure out is I'm trying to figure out the difference between uh, a refugee and a normal uh, Burmese migrant. So, for example, um, I have a maid that helps with my wa- helps my wife, and she is from Burma, <clears throat> um, and uh, she she is 100 percent legal in terms of getting paper and things like that. Um, now, could someone in one of these camps, could they just leave and come to Bangkok and become a maid? Can they do that? Yeah, they can do that, but that, Ill- that is illegal. So that means they have to flee from the camp. And by doing so, it's probably by paying bribe to the people who, you know, taking care of the camp. But they have to know the risk that once a day escape it, it's really hard to go back to the camp. Be- and to go outside, you know, the camp, that means you are not protected by the UN refugees, the UN refugee agency. You're not protected by that. That means you're on your own now. But, you know, for some people, that is better because I have to say that not a lot of people want to resettle to another country, nor they don't want to be trapped in the camp. To resettle in the another country is a totally new country and, you know, something that they don't want to learn. Why do they want to go there instead of staying in Thailand where they can work and they can send the money back to their family in Myanmar and then they can go back whenever they like to, right? But, you know, like, so that's it, the risk that they're willing to take with the police that, you know, might, you know, cost them that they are being illegal and then they have to pay the bribe through all that and then facing the deportation. So you can do that, but you mostly refugee have to make these pro and cons like carefully. Okay. Okay. Well, l- let me just clarify. So are the, are these refugees, are they citizens of Myanmar? Are, are they Burmese citizens? So as for Karen, um, they recognize them as a citizen, unlike Rohingya that you have heard that they consider them as a statelessness, right? But for Karen, they consider them. But the reason why that they fight is because, you know, when the British left the Myanmar, you have all these little tribes, like a hundred tribes that want to take over, um, take control over the country. And Karen happened to be the largest minority ethnics. And they would just like fight, you know, against each other. They have a different point of views in terms of politics and religious. And then it end up that they burn their villages down to the ground. So they have to flee to Thailand and to residing in the camp. So that is a difference okay. here because, um, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Be- so these, so these, these people in Thailand, they, they. Uh, the Karen, at least, they're Burmese citizens, but they don't want to go back to Burma. They don't. They 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 don't want to go back, and they they would maybe like to stay in Thailand, but the Thai government doesn't really want them to stay, so they're stuck in the camp. Is is, is that the basic situation? So the basic situation um, that you think is partly correct. Um, I would say that okay. So whenever we have the refugee crisis, right? We have three ways to deal with it. Um, We call it a durable solution. So we have the local integration, we have the resettlement, and we have the repatriation. So for the resettlement um, is for people who wish to resettle to another country, right? But you have some refugees who do not want to go, but they have to go because of the future of the children to have a better opportunities and better education at the resettled country. You have another group of people and usually older people who fled from their country and then residing in the camps and been there for too long and they don't want to move. They feel like they are a part of Thailand now. They want to integrate with the local people. But the thing is... Um, Thai perspective on that part and the Thai government per se do not really want that to happen yet. This is because of the economic too and for the, and because of the security issues. They are not willing to um, give the citizenship or even allow th- these people to work outside the camps. And then we have the repatriation who 
when I did um, the survey research on my thesis, I found out that not a lot of people want to go back to Myanmar. And that makes sense, not because they don't love their country, but because, you know, everything was burned to the ground. Where are they going back to? Like, they don't even have their own lands. They don't even have their own homes. And they will have to start something from the scratch. And with the little promise from the international organization that will help them rebuild their life when they go back. But, you know, it's not promising. So what they are looking now, I feel like most of the refugees, they want to integrate it to the local. So, yeah, you have like okay. all these so different kinds okay. of people. Okay, but your your specialty was in the the refugees that that either wanted to or felt that they had to be resettled to a third country. So this was your area, is that correct? Yeah, because by the time that I the time that I work in Thailand and both um, in New York is before two thousand sixteen, and the U.S. still. Um, take a lot of refugees from the Southeast, from East Asia, from Myanmar, from Malaysia, from Nepal. And um, because U.S. have a lot of Burmese refugees and they were considered about the, you know, the family. So if you have family in the U.S., you can register to go to the U.S. But it's but I mean, the the process of doing that is just longer. It's not just only because you have a family and then you can go. You have to pass all these security process, which can take up to 10 years. So that is the part that was going when I was doing my job. But now with um, things are different. Um, so we tend to focus on repatriation at the moment, not the re- refugee resettlement and not the local integration. I see. So, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about uh, get into all, all the American politics, but basically, since since Trump, he has kind of shut down the refugee program more or less. So it's harder. So it's harder mm-hmm. to resettle, is what you're saying? Yeah, and it's actually getting harder since 2013 when um, the Obama administration decided to okay, we're gonna stop taking registration from um, Burma um, Burmese refugees. But, you know, it's not as hard as now because that means those people who are qualified and registered as a refugee who has the right to resettle in the United States, they also cannot go either, like have to wait for a really long time. So it's kind of tough um, situation at the refugee resettlement at the moment. And we are, and as in um, Burmese refugee condition in Thailand, we are now looking at the repatriation instead. Okay, I understand. Um, okay, but I want to talk more about the resettlement. So can you tell us a little bit about the process that someone has to go through from beginning? So from, so basically you were up in the camp. You would meet with some of these people who wanted to resettle, and you would start the process of resettlement. Can you just describe the process and, and, and the steps and how long it takes to actually be moved to the United States? <clears throat> Okay, so um, so with my job, um, when I work for International Rescue Committee, I um, basically did the um, I did the fact check and um, the accounts of the backgrounds of the refugees um, for the homeland security before they come in and to determine who are qualified to be you know, to go to the United States, to be the refugee that are qualified to be there. So we do not know that process precisely of what they are doing. It's kind of sensitive, confidential issue. We only prepare for them to come into Thailand and then interview those people. So basically, I prepare a document for them, preparing all the cases, and then I jump into another organization, international organization for migration, and I work for those people who already approved by the Homeland Security that, yes, they can go to the United States. So now we have to prep these refugees to be ready to resettle in the United States. So um, I just want to be clear first that um, when I say that, you know, like when, when you know, when you heard a lot of people say that, oh, did they have a refugee resettle in the United States? 
the number might be like high, like you might hurt like a fifty thousand per year, but it's actually only one percent of the refugee population in the world because they believe that refugee resettlement is not the ultimate solution for the refugee crisis. But we have to do so when local integration and repatriation doesn't work out at that time. So um, once that they part. Um, So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the first step is to have this, you know, approved. And now that they got approved, they can choose where they want to be resettled. And refugees will receive advice um, for choosing a country that with a strong, with a strong immigration tradition. Like you don't want to go to a country that they're not, you know, really open to refugee. And there are 13 countries that that willing to be the host. For the resettlement program, I don't remember all the 13 countries, but I know that there are Australia, Canada, Finland, Norway, Japan, United States, and I'm pretty sure that other countries as well. But they're receiving a small number. So before 2016, United States is um, taking the most refugees, um, Burmese refugee, and the second is Australia, and the third is Canada. How long does that process take from beginning to when they actually are 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 moved? Like, so what? How long does it take for the whole process? So for the whole process, it can be. I never heard anyone that been in the camp less than five years. Um, it can go around like five to twenty five years. It's like a really long process. It not, it's not like, you know, it's not like me. When I applied to school, I got accepted. I passed to, through the security clearance, and then I can jump on the plane and while i in the U.S. They have to go through all these kind of process, like 10 steps to complete before being to be able to leave her in the U.S. They have to pass the security clearance. They, you know, have to make sure that they're not on the blacklist, like becoming the terrorist. And they have to check the fingerprints by the virus um, U.S. government database. And they have to, like, pass the medical screening and they have to pass the cultural orientation. So they have to go through all these process. And it seems just like a, you know, like it's just a five or six step. But, like, the details between each process is like a lot. So, so you're saying it's probably at least five years. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Like if you got five years, it's very lucky, very lucky. So that's why, you know, this is, that's why I told you in the beginning that um, there were some people who do not want to go anymore because they've been residing in the camps for too long and they feel like this is a part of their life now. And now that you have to move to another country when you older, like when you were in the camp, maybe you were like 18. And now 10 years later, when you're 28, you have to go to another country and then you have to, you know, start everything from scratch again. It's kind of hard for them and especially old people, like they do not want to go to the another mm. country because the process has been taking for so long until they get to leave Seattle and meet their family. So um, I'm just curious. So you worked for that that program for six years so were you able to see some Mm -hmm. people who you met in the who you met in the camp who actually were resettled like were there people who actually made the move to the u.s while you were there no unfortunately not because um well so when i work in thailand it's pre-departure right so when i work in the u.s it's post the um post arrival so because um i work um there was a nine national um, agency, resettlement agency in the United States that is reported directly to the Bureau of the Population, Refugees and Migration. So these nine, ref- nine headquarters, um, they will have affiliates throughout the U.S. So I don't met any, um, I didn't meet any refugees that I work with in Thailand because they come through out another organization. I work only with the two organization, but I would say that I met with um, Burmese refugees who were in the camp and were just like, you know, oh, you were in the camp too? Oh, I used to work in the camp. And then we met over there, but we didn't know like personally, but yeah, I met them and I, you know, assist them in helping, 
um, they're getting a job and make sure that they can live their life without our help within after the 180 days, make sure that they can live on their own and know everything about the U.S. culture. And yeah, that's that's part of the job that I do before I work for the national headquarters. Yeah. Okay, I'm curious. So it, now that you have this experience, it, do you think like you like for someone in this field, it would be better if the Thai government recognize them as refugees is this is this a goal is this a goal to get the thai government to sign the refugee treaty this is a tricky part because um as i mentioned since um since thailand um does not um sign the 1951 refugee convention it's kind of hard for international organization to try to influence Thailand on what to do because um, they kind of respect, you know, the sovereignty of the each country. So basically, Thailand, like I said, they can do what they want to. They can dictate their own rules and laws. But by having the refugee camps in Thailand, I feel like this is like generous by the Thai government already, even though I personally think it's not enough, but they allowed it to do so. But there have been, um, you know, a lot of period of time where they announce publicly that they want to shut down the camp. But every time when they do so, then the UN will step in and be like, hey, you know, what's the problem here? You know, we can we can work together and to like elevate the problem that they have here. So basically, this is I don't know. Um, I don't know about the fact here. Like, I don't work in the Thai government here. But I know that when you have um, the refugee camp in the host country, international organization or even the country will do the burden sharing on this part. Like they're not will be just like, OK, you host you host the asylum seeker and that is all yours. But they will also provide a cost you know, to make sure that they those refugees receive the basic needs like food, shelters, and education and health. So I know on that part that Thailand receiving the money from the international aid. I'm not sure. I don't think that by doing that, we can like influence Thai government to finally to eventually, you know, provide a citizenship to the Burmese because at the end of the day, it's up to Thai law. They are not part of the Con- refugee convention, so we cannot really influence them to do anything much. Everything is just up to them. And as I mentioned, Thailand more concerned about economic and, you know, national security issues. So it's really up to okay. the period uh, of time. Another thing I'm curious about is has there been any difference in how the military government deals with the issue as opposed to the elected government before does the does the current government pretty much do the same thing as before or did they change policy at all i think it's kind of the same because i haven't heard any radical thing that's going on in the camp that much i haven't heard anything that um surprising us and terrifying as what is going to happen and I think that has to do with the fact that the number has been um, reducing because you know the program has been running since like 2000 and a lot the number of refugee has been resettled into another countries and we don't really hurt any problems along the border anymore like rally so it's kind of quiet now not really much going on but we still like I mean in the refugee resettlements, um, in refugee setting in Thailand, we still do have a problem of um, what we call the protracted refugees. These are the refugee who we do not know what to do about them yet because they do not qualify to register as a refugee and to resettle to another country and they cannot integrate with the local. So we still have a problem on this part. And um, as far as I know, the Thai government um, fully support to repatriate these people back to Myanmar. So that that's it, the latest thing I have heard so far. Wow. You know, this problem, it um, it really strikes me as one of those problems that there's just not 
a very good solution to, you know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's a long-term problem. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a hundred, you know, it's a hundred thousand people. Um, so it sounds like you, uh, you guys are doing your best. I mean, there's no perfect solution and you guys are just, uh, fighting the good fight and, and, uh, doing your best. Yeah, so basically, like our organization, we are more concerned about the human right issue. Rather, you know, like we don't, we focus on the fair well being of the people, not rather than the security issue like in Thailand. But on the other hand, I kind of understand in Thai people perspective and Thai government perspective too. My only concern is that you can do the repatriation you can send the people back you know to myanmar but only as long as they are volunteer to be back and i know that there are many organizations that watching thailand right now because they were afraid that the government will send the refugees back to myanmar without that consent ah i understand i understand okay well uh plor i wanted to just uh Thank you one more time for coming on the show. This has been uh, an education for me since, to be honest, uh, I didn't know mu that much about it. So uh, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for coming on the Bangkok podcast. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Okay, Ploy, take care. Okay, you too. Thank you so much. You know, Greg, uh, in a way, this topic uh, relates to some extent to our series on Thai identity. Because as Ploy mentioned, um, some people have lived in those camps uh, for a long time, like decades, uh, and, and, and many thousands of them uh, must have been born there. So that means they've been born actually in Thailand. Um, uh, but of course, uh, many Thai people, uh, most Thai people would not accept them as Thai. And in general, uh, they're, they're not Thai citizens. Yeah, you know, Asia, Thailand and Asia in general has a really complicated relationship with other nationalities i mean like we think we've talked about on the show before even if i got thai citizenship and spoken and wrote and read perfect thai i would never be thai i would still be the farang who speaks and, and reads thai really well that's certainly you true know? that's certainly true but but I'm, I'm i'm like a white guy from the other side of the world that's right these people are from right next door so yeah, that's right that's exactly right it is uh it is i, I mean I, I think you put it diplomatically when you said a a, a complicated relationship with with <laughs> with <laughs> with its neighbors that would be that would be a polite way to put it um but anyway uh we are yeah. we are very thankful to ploy for coming on the show uh and uh she is someone we'd like to have back uh, in the future as as the uh the the issue develops uh, because as she said in the in the interview uh there is hopes the thai government uh may may change its tune and, and, and deal with refugees in, in a different manner. So let's hope uh, that yeah. that difficult situation uh, improves. Yeah, I would encourage people to read up a little bit about the refugee situation. There's a lot of really good books out there, too. Um, something that blew my mind when I first started learning about it was a friend of mine used to work for an NGO, and he was responsible for chaperoning refugees who had been re successfully resettled in the United States from Thailand, from Bangkok to Los Angeles. And like you said, many thousands of them have been born in these refugee camps so they've been basically born and grew up in a tent and then they're like hey you're going to america here get on the 747 and so what happened was a lot of these guys were showing up in america you know covered in piss nearly dead from exhaustion and thirst because they didn't know how a bathroom on the airplane worked and they didn't know they how to open a plastic water you know i mean maybe not that extreme right, but right. it was just they had no preparation right. for dealing with these kind of things you know as ploy mentioned in the interview uh, it was partly her job to prepare them for the transition so uh it sounds like things have gotten better since your since your your buddy did it but yeah it's such a it's such a difficult problem i mean it's 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 yeah. a nightmare it's a nightmare and i'm glad i'm get glad there are people out there like ploy who essentially devote their careers to wrestling with this problem yeah true heroes heroes of the community all right let's get into some love loathe or leave this week and that's of course where one of us surprises the other with a particular aspect of living in bangkok which we then discuss and decide if it's something that we love about living here loathe about living here or hate so much that it makes us want to leave forever and this week ed my friend it is your turn what do you got all right. Um, I think I've got a little bit of a different angle for you. Greg, what do you think about Thai electrical sockets? 
<laughs> it's random and strangely specific tie electrical saw because i don't i've never given them much thought maybe because i'm just like a technology gadget like freak and i've got so many gadgets i detest tie electric sockets because for one thing they never have three prongs they never have like the safety prong which is like the ground prong which means hmm. anytime you want to plug something in you have you need an adapter yeah, there, there's, there does seem to be a suspicious number of adapters here. It's like, you know, before Apple got into the dongle business, it's like Thailand got into it before first. You know, it's like, yeah, we could make everything fit in the same way, but how about we just throw a bunch of adapters on the market and you need to buy five of each type every time you have a new device? That's right. I mean, besides the lack of the grounding plug, another problem is like some, some tie sockets are like slits, which are a little bit more Western, but a lot of them are more like circles, like it's it's more like yeah, a, it's, holes. it's more like a hole, which means that uh, like when you get you know, like sometimes I buy a uh, a power strip like for Thailand, you know, and it it doesn't fit in, in the holes. Like it's like I I think the holes are a little bit older, and I think they're kind of switching to to things that are more like slits. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good one because you know now that I think about it, they do piss me off. I do loathe them. I think because it's 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 it happens way too often where you plug something in and it's just kind of hanging there yes it, and you're look and you're looking at it like that's that's not safe it, <laughs> and it also happens way too often where you're like i need a new extension cord a new a new you know extender for my cables or something and you go and you and you it's just a huge bin of them at the grocery store or the power store and they cost like a dollar 50 yeah and you're wondering like how how safe are these things you know like this is carrying a current from my computer across the floor to my television or whatever and <laughs> It's well, the flimsiest plastic crappy looking things ever well as we know from uh looking outside at the tangled wires running down the street um i think i, I don't think thailand leads the world in electrical safety no no and that's it's actually you know we we joke about it but it's it ain't funny and, and, and i just i think about a story a, a very sad story i read a few months back where some like norwegian family was visiting samui or cement or something like that and they're seven or eight year old son was on the beach and he was digging a hole and he and he stuck his shovel into a electrical cable that was buried under the beach oh, and died oh my god yeah a tragic this is just terrible terrible and like that shit can, shouldn't happen definitely not um definitely not so I, I think if there's one thing you're gonna like play fast and loose with it shouldn't be you know sidewalks is one thing maybe like parking spaces all right give those a miss but when it comes to electricity i mean do your homework no doubt no doubt anyway yeah. so, so maybe, loathe Low, thank you. I mean, maybe maybe I'm kind of pushing one of my pet peeves on you, but I'm gl I'm glad you're on board with the, with the loathing of Thai electrical sockets. Loathe, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, so as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Scott for lending us his support at the show shoutout level. And Greg, what did you find out about Scott? Well, as you might remember, Ed uh, Scott co-hosted for you uh, one show about a couple of months back when you were unavailable. So uh, he's a friend of the show, and he's a friend of mine. I've known him since I was literally my very first day in Bangkok. He's a great guy. However, that being said, I did discover something weird. And as I discussed on a recent bonus episode, uh, I was recently at a friend's house to go swimming with my son when it started raining. Well, that friend I was at his house, that was Scott. And figuring that we'd get wet anyway, Scott suggested we just stick with the plan and jump in the pool. You know, what do we got to lose? And I said, sure, why not? And my son was loving it because, you know, kids like being out in the rain. And it was very rainy and very stormy that day. But we still had fun. Uh, and we finished up and, and continued our day. But a few days later, I discovered that the day before we went swimming, Scott had taken out a life insurance policy on me with him as the beneficiary. Oh, really? I didn't even know he could do that. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So uh, I didn't think much of it at first. I thought it was a bit weird and maybe I thought I'd bring it up with him next time I saw him. But then yesterday I got a package in the mail. Scott had sent me some golf clubs out of the blue with a note that said, next time it rains, let's head for the driving range. Ho -ho. I thought it was a ho -ho. little bit weird. So I can't help but think Scott is trying to get me killed by lightning to get his hands on that life insurance. I'm onto your scam, buddy. I'm onto your scam, Scott, and it won't work. I'll still go golfing with you, but next time I am using my son's Fisher Price plastic clubs. That is a good idea. That is a very good idea. Yeah. Crazy Bangkok. You never, you never know what kind of people are going to be. <laughs> That's right. I'm just kidding, Scott. I'm just kidding, Scott. Thanks for your support, man. We really do appreciate it. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I'd like to give a special thanks to all of our patrons who are listening now. As everyone knows, we don't run ads or have sponsors, so we really, really do appreciate the support we get from our patrons. 
And if you want to get in touch with us, it's easy. Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We always write back. If you write it, we will answer it. That's right. You can also find us on the Line app, where we post each episode a few days late, and uh, also carry on conversations with our listeners. You can also reach out to me directly on Twitter, if you so please, where I am, BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone, and uh, we'll see you back here next week. Yeah, that, that's a very good. Yeah, that's a very good. I can't even think of what I'm saying. Fuck, I need that. I need that coffee, man.